Next up, infective endocarditis. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm very fortunate because the BCS have invited me to speak about two of my pet subjects in one morning. And it's a great pleasure to talk to you now about infective endocarditis, which of course is a scourge associated with heart valve disease across the spectrum of its manifestations. So it's a bit early for lunch. The good news is that lasagna tastes better than endocarditis. And it has much better clinical outcomes. Because endocarditis, I will argue to you, is the most dangerous condition that will be presented at this symposium this week. In the 21st century, endocarditis has an in-hospital mortality affecting one in five patients. It has a one-year mortality affecting one in three patients. It is associated with major life-changing complications and half of the patients need a high-risk, difficult valve operation. So I want you to listen very carefully to the next 20 minutes presentation. These data were brought into uh, contemporary relief by the findings of the Euro Endo survey conducted by the European Society of Cardiology a year or so ago and presented at the European Society of Cardiology last September. And the conclusion of Gilbert Habib, who coordinated the study from Marseille, was consistent with my first slide that endocarditis remains deadly and it has an innate ability to evolve beyond the intelligence and the wisdom of the doctors looking after it. Again, we have robust guidance from the European Society of Cardiology which supports the majority of contemporary treatment recommendations. But I want to point out to you in what is a very strongly evidence-based discipline that we are very sorely lacking in robust evidence to support the management of infective endocarditis. Indeed, the majority of the recommendations in the guidelines, both in the US and, the, uh, and in Europe, are based upon level 2A or 2B evidence, emerging from registries alone, and the majority are at the level of evidence B or C, the majority being at level C, which is upon the uh, opinion of experts based upon their clinical experience, but very little data. And indeed, th this slide is now a year or so out of date, but this is the complete summation of the randomised control trial evidence in infective endocarditis over a 20-year period the majority of which relate to regimes of antibiotic treatment and very few of which actually formally assess other management algorithms. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about prophylaxis, which is always a topical discussion in the UK. I want to talk to you about new improved tools for diagnosis and I want to talk to you a little bit about the timing of surgery and our need to be more aggressive as a community in this setting. The concept that endocarditis is a disease caused by dentists is of course a historic one and one that has been challenged in recent years not only by the lack of randomised control trials but also by NICE here in the UK and also by the recognition of microbiological surveys that oral streptococci are now a less common, less frequent cause of endocarditis in the 21st century. This is a meta-analysis that we performed and published in Heart a few years ago, which demonstrates that there is very little evidence uh, strongly supporting a strategy of antibiotic prophylaxis uh, to protect against endocarditis. The problem with analyses such as these is that they are performing analyses of very limited data sets. 
We have no randomised control trial. There will never be a randomised control trial of antibiotic prophylaxis uh, for endocarditis because it would be too difficult and too expensive. Believe me, because I've tried and I've got the T-shirt and it will never, never happen. So we need to rely on uh, alternative forms of evidence and we need to rely on our clinical wisdom and judgment. As you will know, in 2008, NICE recommended in the UK that antibiotic prophylaxis was no longer uh, applicable in the absence of evidence and they recommended that it should cease altogether. And you can see in the year or so afterwards, this advice was taken very seriously, particularly by the dental community, and prescriptions for amoxicillin 3 grams once plummeted by 95% within six weeks of the NICE guidance. There was a tale of resistance, and I can see Howard Swanton in the audience, who will remember the tale of, of resistance, because cardiologists were concerned about their high-risk patients in particular, and we shall discuss that shortly. But I want to take you back to an important publication that I was very privileged to be part of that was published in The Lancet in 2014, that pointed out in 2008 there was a change in the gradient of the incidence of aortic stenosis in the UK, which statistically exceeded the preceding gradient with an inflection that I believe was statistically significant at around the time point that the guidelines were published. Now, regrettably in the UK, we do not have data concerning the organisms responsible for endocarditis. We don't have a national registry. It is not a reportable disease. So we do not know whether this change related to streptococcal organisms, in which case dental prophylaxis could be important, or whether it was part of a wider trend with a coincident change in the gradient in early 2008. We recently had opportunity to update these data. And I have to tell you that they will be published in The Lancet in a few weeks' time, but I'm not allowed to tell you the results. But they do make interesting reading, and I ask you to look out for the publication. Because we do need to recognise that endocarditis is on the march, and whether or not you have prophylaxis guidelines in place or not, the incidence is increasing in all countries across the world. I'm showing here some data from the US that show similar trends, whether it's the streptococci or staphylococci, and there are similar data sets now emerging from Scandinavia, mainland Europe, and elsewhere in the world that show that the trends are the same. These are difficult data to digest, and we have to apply our clinical wisdom to work out how to offer the best treatment to our patients. And in Europe, certainly for the time being, there is still a, a recognition that certain subsets of patients are at particular risk of the disease, namely those with a prosthetic valve, those with a previous history of the condition, and those who have complex, particularly cyanotic, congenital heart disease. And in the absence of evidence of harm, the European guidelines recommend that these patients should still receive antibiotic prophylaxis at the time of invasive dental procedures. They're at the highest risk, and we're offering them a low-risk intervention by means of a single dose of amoxicillin. And whilst there is still resistance in NICE to this pushback from the cardiological community, there is now wriggle room within the NICE guidelines to allow clinicians <laughs> to apply their judgment, and certainly it's our practice at Guy's and St Thomas's, and it was our practice at Oxford, where I used to work before moving to London, that we adhere to the European guidelines without performing our own version of Brexit. Now, diagnosis. The most important bullet on this slide is the first bullet, because you will never diagnose endocarditis unless you think of it as a diagnosis. If you treat your patient with a prosthetic valve who's breathless for pneumonia, you will miss the boat. 
If you dismiss your patient who had endocarditis two years ago, saying that their fever is related to flu, you will miss the boat. So please consider the diagnosis in everybody who is at risk. Then you can apply microbiological imaging and sophisticated markers of inflammation to confirm your clinical suspicion. You might consider that old-fashioned, but it is true. Because diagnostic delay is the principal cause of mortality in this patient cohort. Diagnostic delay is unfortunately common. It's frequently the underlying reason for medico-legal action. You can't blame the GP, because my wife's a GP. <laughs> but you need to recognise that the typical GP will see one case of endocarditis in their entire career. They will see a lot of patients with a temperature, malaise and fatigue, particularly this week. <laughs> so it's the responsibility of specialists, and I don't mean specialists in, in endocarditis, but I mean specialists in the hospital, be they physicians, be they uh, respiratory specialists, be they vascular surgeons, be they neurologists, to think about endocarditis when patients present in acute uh, manifestations, be they embolic, be, be they infective, or be they related to uh, cardiac decompensation. <coughs> because if you wait too long, you wish these bad outcomes on the patients, and you also diminish the opportunity to intervene early with antibiotics, which reduce the incidence of major embolism including stroke. Now beyond the clinical tools, we of course have imaging tools and echocardiography is exquisitely helpful in endocarditis, whether it's transthoracic or transesophageal. We now live in an era where CT is growing in its importance, particularly when patients are being considered for complex aortic root surgery. We also have the possibility of PET-CT, to light up uh, zones of infection within the heart, or zones of inflammation, should I say more correctly, and illustrate the location of infection, particularly when it's difficult to discern clinically. And here's a nice patient, for example, well, not a nice patient, but some nice images from a patient who uh, up here has prosthetic aortic or mitral valve uh, hotspots, and here's a different page set of patients with devices in place one of whom has a pocket infection, and one of whom has a lead infection. And these investigations uh, should reside in the hands of specialists, but they are very, very helpful for these cases which are difficult to unravel. And indeed, these newer modalities of investigation and imaging were recommended within the European guidelines that I referred to earlier. With regard to treatment, well, of course, the mainstay of treatment has been prolonged intravenous antibiotic treatment, recognising that the organisms are seated deep within the body, that tissue penetration within the myocardium is difficult to achieve, and that careful titration and monitoring not only of the patient, but also of their antibiotic levels and sensitivities, is very important to achieve effective control. But this traditional algorithm was turned a little bit on its head by the publication of the POET trial from an esteemed group of uh, investigators in Scandinavia in 2018, in which they challenged the dogma that six weeks of intravenous treatment was required and suggested that two weeks or thereabouts would be sufficient with a switch to oral treatment thereafter. And you can see that they weren't particularly selective in their patients uh, uh, randomised in this trial. 38% of them had undergone surgery. The majority, the, all of them had left-sided endocarditis <coughs> with a variety of organisms. And indeed, a quarter of them had prosthetic valve infection. 
And these patients received a mean, a mean, yes, a mean, and a minimum, a mean of 17 days, and a minimum of 10 days intravenous antibiotics before they were randomized either to continue the intravenous regime or switch to a tailored oral regime according to the causative organism. And you can see here in these outcome charts that the primary endpoint of death, unplanned surgery, an embolic event or recurrence of infection was the same in both treatment arms, suggesting that this new regime would be better for patients and would be better for the healthcare economy in that these patients could be discharged from hospital and monitored carefully on a weekly basis as an outpatient. Now it remains a little bit of a mystery to me why this trial has not been adopted more extensively and we are still working to a six weeks antibiotic IV antibiotic regime for the majority of patients even in specialist centres. I can tell you that the POET 2 trial is also planned currently, and this will be a regime of two weeks intravenous treatment only. And randomising that compared with the conventional six week dogma. And it will be very interesting to, interesting to watch the progress of that trial over the coming years. Now, finally, just a few points about surgery, because as I told you in my first slides, 50% of our patients with endocarditis will need a surgical intervention. And the key questions are who and when. So we need to recognise that there is a balance to be met here between the risks and the jeopardies of ongoing bacteremia versus the ongoing tissue destruction within the heart, which clearly has very important anatomically co-located structures, such as conduction tissue, interventricular septum, mitral valve leaflets, aortic root uh, abscess. And all of these uh, adjacencies are important because destruction or erosion of any of these can be associated with catastrophic outcomes for the patient. And the European guidelines of 2015 were the first to suggest some degrees of urgency and to set some criteria within which these interventions should be offered. The highest risk patients and those who need surgery are those with heart failure, those with uncontrolled infection and those who are at risk of systemic embolism, particularly stroke. And these patients should all be undergoing emergency or urgent surgery. And by this we mean not surgery next week, not surgery when I do my next list. We mean as an emergency, often within 24 or 48 hours. And this is a challenge to the accepted surgical ways of working because surgeons now need to work together in teams to offer a service that runs seven days a week and they need to work together closely since younger surgeons frequently have not had exposure to the complexities of the surgery required for these patients and will often require support from their older, more experienced colleagues. We also need to recognise that earlier surgery has limited support from the evidence base. This is another randomised control trial, this time from South Korea, looking at the benefits of early surgery for relatively uncomplicated left-sided endocarditis. And in short, this study demonstrated that there was no hazard associated with early surgery, illustrated here. There was no risk of major recurrence of infection, but there was important advantages in relation to uh, secondary endpoints, particularly the prevalence of systemic embolism or stroke, and secondly, the need for repeat hospitalisation for heart failure. So endocarditis, as I think I've demonstrated to you, is a complex disease. If it's complex, it's not appropriate to manage it by yourself. 
And the other major uh, emergence in the last decade has been the concept of heart team working for these patients, a team encompassing cardiologists who are interested in the condition, cardiologists who are good at imaging, microbiologists who can help us with our choice of antibiotics, surgeons who can do the operation in a timely fashion, and, when required, other specialists such as spinal surgeons, neurologists, peripheral vascular surgeons, who can help in the management of the multi-morbid, multi-system patient. And these uh, teams will conventionally work in large hospitals, by definition, and therefore it's appropriate in the 21st century that patients with endocarditis should, in the whole, on the whole, be managed within these reference centres, or certainly discussed and managed hand in hand in a referring hub and spoke network. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. So, uh, three wonderful talks and start to the morning. Um, please save your questions. We've got a half an hour. Um, ask the expert panel. Um, ah, okay. So, sorry. We have the ability.